Well, thank you, thank you. I'm humbled by the fact that anyone would come back to hear me the second time. Thank you, church, for your support of our mission. Uh, it is faithful. It's true. We know it's there. And we appreciate that. Thank you so much for the support that you give uh, to us and World Harvest Baptist Mission. I told you a little bit about the mission this morning. And... Uh, our beginning was in Myanmar, and now we're in Manipur, India, and we're in uh, Nepal, we're in uh, Kenya, Africa, and uh, we have Bible colleges in those areas, we have children's homes, uh, we have uh, uh, workers that are preaching the gospel every day, we have um, those of our team that go over there. And, and help and train and, and work with them. And it, it's so good to be a part of a ministry that is Bible-based and trying to our best to do it right. Uh, we don't just see people saved and uh, pray a prayer and that's it and sign a card and now you're a member of the church. Uh, when we have people come forward in an invitation, they accept Christ as their Savior. We pray with them. We tell them what the Bible says, but they cannot join the church there until they have been baptized, and uh, they, then they can join the church. And they cannot be baptized and join the church until they have met one-on-one -on -one with one of our workers for at least an hour so that they understand totally what has happened in their life, why it happened, how it happened, and who it's all about. So we're, we're thankful for that and our Bible distribution ministry. We have, uh, in the last uh, four or five years, we've averaged giving from... Uh, uh, about 2,000 Bibles a month out. Uh, and we are praying that this year uh, we will, we, we average from one to 2,000 Bibles a month. We're praying that this year we will be able to distribute <coughs> into the hands of people 50,000 Bibles. And we, we appreciate your prayers and your, your gift toward that part of our ministry. We now have, uh, we're, we have evangelism teams in, active in 15 regions of the countries that we serve. We have three building projects underway at the present time in Tamu, Myanmar, uh, a children's home, a headquarters uh, little building, and a church building, and another in Nepal, and one that we are just starting in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with the Zomi people. Financial needs, certainly, with any mission, are great. We, uh, uh, of course, need financial, personal financial support. We need uh, construction funds for our training center in uh, Galesville, Alabama, where we bring pastors in, both from the states and overseas, and, and train them. Uh, and if you have a gift toward that, we need about $150,000 this month, uh, and we can finish up what we're doing there. And uh, if you want to give it, we would certainly accept it. And uh, just write a personal check. We'll take that. You know. Last week, uh, I told you about the children's home about a month ago being destroyed there in Tamu. Last week we received a letter from the government in Kenya that we must register our children's home there. And that's normal in that area. And uh, so we said, okay, uh, how much does that cost? 
and they explain to Brother Jay, well, you're a nonprofit organization, so it's free. But the paperwork, $6,500. <laughs> We're in that process also. About six weeks ago, God worked a miracle in the life and time of World Harvest Baptist Mission. Told you a little bit about Galesville, Alabama. Well, Galesville does not even have a bank. So our bank is in Cedar Bluff, which is right next door, and it has a population of about a thousand people. But in order to transfer monies to our ministries, particularly in Myanmar and all the other countries, really, we have to go through a process. We cannot send money directly into Myanmar, for instance, because of the military coup and the takeover and the government running everything and so forth and so on. So we have a banker there in Alabama where we, we keep the, the funds that come in for the overseas ministries. We transfer money from there to a bank in San Francisco. Then the bank in San Francisco transfers this money to Singapore. And in Singapore, they transfer the money to a bank, or really a, a broker, in China, who literally hates us, the country does, but this person happens to be a Christian. So we transfer money into China through a process, and they, in turn, can smuggle this money into Myanmar and take care of the need there, like building the children's home. That, that, that is primary in our minds right now. About six weeks ago, Jay McGoy, who's uh, just a plain old Alabama country boy, that was very successful in pastoring, and God put him in the mission work. Jay was uh, sitting in the bank there in uh, Alabama to transfer some money to Myanmar to rebuild this children's home. They needed about $4,000 to build this children's home. And he's sitting there, and the lady that was waiting on him excused herself. She had to go do something in the computer room to transfer, to do whatever they do. Jay's sitting there, and in the door of the bank, it's a small bank, walked four people, an older man and his wife, and two young adult men. Jay's sitting there, and he says, you know, to himself, I think those people are from the Chin State Minimal. They just look like it. So Jay gets up and goes and introduces himself to them in the little bit of language of theirs that he knows. And uh, they said, yes, we're from Myanmar. We're with the Hoka tribe. The Hokas are a group of people in the country that is much larger than the Zomis that we've been working with for years. But the Hawkas, you could not go to their villages, you could not go in their area, you could not speak to them without a personal invitation. We wanted to evangelize that area. But even our evangelists there that work with us said, we can't go to those people. They'll kill us. Well, these people, it was a man, his wife, and two grown sons, were in Alabama. And Jay said, what are you doing here? Well, we're come, we've come here to run a chicken farm. Now, wait a minute. Alabama to Tamu is 27 hours in an airplane. 
I don't know what y'all call it up here in the Northland, but in Georgia we say that's a fur piece. And these people are hawkers. So Jay starts talking to them. Well, where are you living? Well, we, we have a tent and our car, and we're clearing a piece of land to put a mobile home on, and it's taken us a long time to do that. So Jay takes them home with him. Jay's wife is a, a ER and trauma nurse at hospital in Center, Alabama, and Jamie comes home and she's got four guests. They were there for about two and a half weeks while Jay took a tractor and went with them to clear their land, get their trailer there. But he brings them home and he's, he's trying to talk to them. And he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get our man in, that's in charge of our group in the Chin State. Let me get him on the phone. He can interpret for us and we can understand each other a little better. So he gets uh, Brother Sambo on the phone and he tells him what has happened. And he says, these people are from the Hawka tribe. And Sambo says, well, you know, Brother Jay, my wife was a Hawka. And Jay said, I didn't know that. And he said, let me put her on the phone, let her talk to them. They were her cousins. They have a larger population of hawkers in the United States than the Zomis, and we founded 12 churches in the Zomi communities. We now have an open door into the American hawker people to go and preach the gospel and plant Baptist churches. We now have an open door in the, in the country of Myanmar to go and uh, evangelize their people. We've been invited in there. We have no restrictions. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people, most of which have never heard one word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've never seen the Bible. They've never been to a church. But there are souls that God wants reached for His glory. And you know, we look at we look at our world. We we look at our country. And and good night alive. We, we find trouble all over this world. It is, it is something that is just running wild. And we think, well, America's in trouble. Every country in our world is in trouble. But I want to speak to you tonight concerning what can we do? in America and in the world. You know, I'll not try to address all the issues of the world tonight, but I do want to say some things before I preach that I think need saying. In this corrupt world, we are constantly being bombarded with lies and deceit and corruption and murders and rapes and stealing and underhanded dealings of those who are in power. Doesn't have to be in Myanmar, a third world country. It's right here at home. And you know, we have a, a vile media that seems to think it's their job to keep the fires burning, to keep this uh, their agenda before the people. And I was talking, I, I, I've talked to some of our people there, and I talked to Jay, and 
They say it's the same thing over there. Same thing over there. Have you ever thought about just giving up? Have you ever seen so dis been so discouraged that you really didn't know what to do? Well, if you got breath in you, you've probably been there. Let me say something that I think I need that needs saying. Just my opinion. And if you object to it or disagree with it, that's your right to do so. I believe the United States is the best place on the face of the earth to live. I am glad. I am proud to be an American. I'm glad I was born in the United States. And yet we have politicians that want us to follow them, do what they dictate and what they want done, and they don't even know which bathroom to use. Well, man alive, they, they, uh, they don't even know when a baby's born where it's going to be a boy or girl, and they're sitting there looking at it. It's a terrible shape we're in terrible shape that we're in all the problems are being blamed on bad cops and guns well the problem's not guns and it's not police brutality I have a gun or two or three and they don't want to try to come take my guns. The problem is hearts without Jesus. The problem is homes without discipline. The problem is schools without prayer. The problem is government without God. And courts without justice. And murders disguised as protest. And disrespect for law by a crowd of thugs that feel like they're entitled to get something for nothing. What's the answer? What's the answer? We look around us and, and, and good night, it's, it's, it's terrible. Second Chronicles 7.14 is the answer. For there the Word of God says, If my people... My people. Hey, folks, that's us. If my people, which are called by my name, Christians, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Ladies and gentlemen, it's up to you and me. It's up to you and me. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. You've heard this passage of Scripture, I'm sure, dozens and dozens and dozens of times, but uh, one more might be another blessing for you. In, in, in chapter 37, verse 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was me, I'd be looking around thinking, God, do you really know what you're doing? <laughs> Listen, and cause me to pass by them round about. And behold, there was very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. These bones have been laying there in the sun for a long time. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Can, 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 can these bones live? And he said, I answered, 
O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, prophesy upon these bones. And say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause uh, breath to enter into you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and you will bring and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So he said, So I prophesied. So I prophesied. And I was, as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Now I wonder how he felt when that happened. <laughs> there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but they there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man. Say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied, as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. An exceeding great army. I said a little while ago, If we are to see an answer to our problems in America and in the world, it's up to you and me. Well, preacher, don't you understand? We're, we're, we're a small church in a small town in Ohio, and we just can't, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't, and, and the, the, the job is so great. Uh, we can't do that. Hold on. How did Ezekiel react when the nation was in rebellion? How did he respond to a people who were depressed? How did the awakening come? Some say we need a revival. There's so many dead bones out there we might need a resurrection. Can this be, how can this be done? Follow God's plan. And God's plan is right here. Listen, listen. First of all, there was the man of God. Well, Brother Langley, you know, we have the man of God, Brother. Brother Roy is, is the man of... Hey, every man that's saved is a man of God. There is such a thing as individual responsibility on the part of the Christian. Individual responsibility. When God got ready for an awakening, He called him a man. We read there in verse 1, A hand of the Lord was upon me. And he carried me out in the spirit and set me down in the midst of the dry bone. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman that will allow God to use you? God has always used men and women that were willing to be used. Young and old. Red and yellow, black and white. He's always used them. He was realistic about where he was. Verse 2 said, It caused me to pass by them uh, round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. 
and they were very dry. Let's be realistic about America and our world. It is going down the tubes. We have, we, we have over 330 million people in America that must be made aware of where we, of, uh, of where we are. Most are lost and dying without God. You remember the old saying that you've heard many times, I'm sure. You can't get a man saved till you get him lost. He's got to know he's lost. The prodigal son got realistic. Remember the prodigal son? He would have still been in the honky-tonk down next door to the hog pen except for a famine in the land. There's a famine in the land today, people. America is starving to death without the bread of life. And I'm afraid that our leaders are down in the honky-tonk next door to the hog pen making a peace treaty with the devil. Let's be realistic. God needs a few good men and women to tell America and the world about Jesus. Who, me? Well, now we've got Micah, and he's a young man, and he can, he can carry on this thing. And Who, me? I'm too old. Give me a break. Give me a break. It amazes me that people can't uh, speak to someone about church and the Lord, but they can get on the telephone and gossip for an hour. Right. Well, preacher, I can't talk to people about that. I can't talk to people about that. I remember a message by missionary Mel Neal. Missionary served out of our church in the country of Ecuador for about 50 years. This, mission, this missionary brought a message one night or one day that he entitled, I'm just a nobody. Can God use me? Yes! God can use anybody that will allow God to use them. Well, the man must be teachable. Well, preacher, you know, I can't talk to anybody about their soul. I can't talk to anybody about you. I didn't go to Bible college like Brother Micah did. Ezekiel realized he didn't have all the answers. For he said in, in, in verse 3, He said to me, Son of man, can these bone, bones live? And he said, I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. What he was saying was, I don't know God, but I'm sure you do. As I've already said, we have tried it a hundred different ways and nothing has worked. Why not ask God for the answer? Oh God, Thou knowest. Amen. Secondly, first of all, we have the man of God and then we have the Word of God. Verse 4, again, He said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, Know ye dry bones, hear ye the Word of the Lord. Paul said to Timothy, Preach the Word. You know what we do in, 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 in Kenya, Africa, and in Nepal, and in Manipur, India, and in, in, in uh, Myanmar, and in the United States? What do we use? We use the Word of God. We preach the Word of God. Amen. Folks, you can't be saved outside the Word of God. You, you, you've got to have the Word of God. Paul said, preach it. The Word is the answer even though they don't want to hear it. And in verse 5 uh, and 6, he called for a decision. Ye shall know that I am the Lord. We must proclaim the Word of God in word and life in a way that demands an answer. Let me 
tell you something about the Word of God, our Bible. It tells me what I am. It tells me what I can do. Even at my age. And what you can do at your age. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It tells me what I should believe. It tells me what I have. Tells me where I came from. Tells me why I'm here. And praise God, it tells me where I'm going. The message of this book is authentic. It is genuine. It's powerful and it's beneficial. It needs to be believed and, and practiced and told and retold. Hey, Tell it in the church house and tell it in the schoolhouse. Tell it in the state house and tell it in the prisons. Tell it in the hospital and tell it in the neighborhoods. Tell it in the country and then tell it in the city. Tell it in the mountains and then tell it in the valley. Tell it far. Tell it near. Tell it everywhere. Amen. A Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball told it to Dwight L. Moody who told it to J. Wilbur Chapman who told it to Mordecai Ham who told it to a young man named Billy Graham who told it to the world that Jesus saves don't tell me you can't do it Thirdly, we have the man of God and the word of God and now the breath of God. Verses 7, 8, 9, 10. The breath of God. The Holy Spirit of God gives the power to live, to work, and do. He gives the means of resurrection. The Holy Spirit of God gives the fires of revival. The Holy Spirit of God is the birthing agent of the Trinity. There was a noise and a shaking. And old Ezekiel's looking around. I, you know God! It's a noise and a shaking. There must be a Holy Spirit conviction before any man comes to life in Jesus Christ. And as you go out, if you're bold enough to do so, and witness to a person, if you're willing to do so, you can't save a tadpole. Only the Holy Spirit can do that work. Listen, folks. We can be the man of God. We can have the Word of God. And we possess the breath of God. Verse 8 tells us they look good. They look good. But, I mean, the skin was there. The, the muscle was there. The bones were coming together. They, they, they look good. But there wasn't any breath in them. The greatest problem we have today in our churches and in our country and in our world is we've got a lot of people that call themselves Christians that look good. They're looking good folks, but they have no life in them. I know Brother Roy has experienced this. Have you ever, <laughs> you ever been to a funeral home at a viewing and have somebody walk up to the casket and say, oh, they look so good. They're dead! We got a lot of people that call themselves Christians that look good. But they don't have the breath of life in them. They may look good in life. 
They may look good in morals. They may look good in family life. But they're not alive. They're without the Holy Spirit of God. How does all this change? We look at verse 10. So I. One man. Just one. So I. One man. Just as communism started with one man by the name of Karl Marx. Just as the Reformation started with one man named Martin Luther. Just as the Welch revival started with just one young lady who said, I want everyone to know about my Jesus. And she gave her testimony in uh, Sunday school. And that revival was still going on a hundred years later and became known as the Great Welch Revival. Dead bodies came to life because one man did what God said that one man ought to do. Would you want revival for America to come through you? You know, we, we used to sing a little chorus that said, God send a revival and let it begin in me. I haven't heard that verse in a hundred years, I guess, but we used to sing that all the time. Lord, send a revival and let it begin in me. As the invitation is carved on the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, to the world, to bring the world's needy, we will help. We should say to a world and a country in, de in decline, bring it to God. Bring it to God. He specializes in taking care of things like that. The problems with America are overwhelming. The answers lie within the man of God, the woman of God, the Word of God, and the breath of God. And despite what the government says, the church is an essential business. If America is to be saved, America must get saved. America must get saved. It's up to us. What are we willing to do? You see, you must be saved to convince anyone else their need to be saved. Lost people don't lead others to Christ. Your life speaks volumes. What is it saying? What is it saying? And I know... I know that we, as we grow older, as we have been in church a long time, I, 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 I realize that we tend to come to the place where we just kind of want to sit back and let somebody else do it. Well, somebody else died last week. It's up to us. You know, your life speaks volumes. What is it saying? Are you saved? Do you know that you know that you know that you know if you died tonight, you're going to heaven? I mean, you, you've got to know that. Oh, how many times have I had people, and Brother Roy's had people say, well, when we ask them the question, well, I hope I am. Well, I don't hope I am. I know I am. Do you know? Are you absolutely sure? And if you're not, you need to come in this invitation tonight and meet with a worker here at the altar and make sure that you're saved. And if you are saved, would you be willing to say to the Lord, Use me. Just use me. Would you be willing? 
mom, dad, grandmother, granddad. You have someone that you love that's lost without God. You have someone that is near and dear to your heart that's lost without God. Would you be willing to kneel on a bended knee and say, God, let me be the instrument you use to lead that soul to Jesus? Well, preacher, I don't know about that. Hey, call their name to the Lord. Lord, let me be the one to lead Paul to Christ. Or Jane. Or whoever it may be. You've got someone that you know and love that's lost. You've got someone that you know and love probably that's, that's saved, but they're, they, they, they don't darken the doors of the church. What can you do about it? You can be the one man or the one woman with the Word of God and the plan of God and the Spirit of God upon your life to change that life forever. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that? Stand with me with heads bowed and eyes closed, please.